again, thank you for being here at uh, Poultry 101, and I, I definitely want to acknowledge the support from the Rural Maryland Council. Um, and this third session right before lunch is understanding science, and I'm, I'm grateful that um, these folks let me stand up here with them and pretend to be a scientist again. Um, my background is in science, and I actually have a master's degree from right here at University of Maryland, where I worked in the che at the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. And just as sort of a, a point of reference, um, coming back to Maryland after more years than I'd like to admit, um, there are, have been some astonishing improvements. And, and I'm not trying to say that we're done and that you know we can relax and take our foot off the accelerator. But ha having left when dead zones were confusing, scary, and growing, and Fisteria was a big deal, coming back today and seeing the improvements, particularly this last summer, is extraordinary. And I'm not sure that those of you that spend every day immersed in trying to keep the bay clean and trying to keep the improvements coming really recognize the many successes that you've had. Um, and I think it's really important that we all step back, breathe a sigh of relief, and then keep going as hard and as fast as we have been in all levels of the industry, both ag and residential and every other manner. So I would like to just quickly acknowledge our, our three panelists. We've got Kelly Schenk, the Agricultural Advisor for the EPA, Dr. Beth McGee, Director of Science and Agricultural Policy at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Hans Schmidt, Assistant Secretary of Resource Conservation for the Maryland Department of Agriculture, and also a farmer. Um, I'd like to welcome you and invite Kelly up here to begin your program. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I loved that growers panel. I think the more we can understand the life of growers and, and the challenges and successes, the better off we are and all working together and, and um, having food and profitable agriculture and clean water. And that's a big mantra of mine as an ag advisor. I'm kind of the link between the ag community and our agency and always looking for those opportunities to work together to have both thriving agriculture and clean water. So I was asked to um, start this science session with talking about what we've done together to better define poultry nutrient generation in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So that's gonna be the, the focus of my talk. Um, just a little bit of context, um, no matter where you are in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, whether, whether you're upstream, trout fishing, um, whether you're down on the eastern shore kayaking near the marshlands or you're at our office in the you know, Annapolis City Marina, um, we have about 90% of our waters are impaired either due to nitrogen, phosphorus, or sediment. And we're really fortunate to have a long history of the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership um, with many stakeholders at the table working to define the problems and solve the problems together. Um, as, as many of you know, in 2010, we developed as a partnership the um, Chesapeake Bay Pollution Diet or the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. And that was when we basically, each state um, has a certain nutrient and sediment reduction to achieve to help restore the Chesapeake Bay. And so each of the state's watershed implementation plans maps out what portion of the reductions they plan to get from wastewater treatment plant upgrades, what portion from urban stormwater runoff controls, what per portion from agricultural conservation practices. And they set what we call two-year milestones. Every two years they say, here's what we plan to reduce over this two-year period. Here are the practices we plan to have on the ground. And our ultimate goal is that in 2025, we would have all the practices on the ground that ultimately, factoring in lag time, would result in the Chesapeake Bay um, water quality standards being met. And we measure progress annually using modeling tools and then the ultimate indicator is water quality monitoring and whether those standards are met. Um, when you look at the state's plans watershed wide and you ask what are they really relying on in terms of reductions to reach the Chesapeake Bay restoration goals, there is a, a heavy reliance on agriculture. Agriculture is a big part of the, of the solution here. 
Um, Watershed-wide, states are relying on agriculture to achieve about two-thirds of the nutrient reductions that are needed to restore the bay. And if you go into a, a state like Delaware that's very ag-dominated, they're relying on agriculture to get about 90% of the reductions that ne they need to reach their Chesapeake Bay goals. So it was about this time um, when the TMDL was just kicking in, where it was being developed, um, that the U.S. Poultry and Egg Association um, came to EPA and said, listen, we, you know, the stakes are high, you know, we've got these watershed implementation plans being developed, we have these goals, this accountability, we, we want to make sure we understand how the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership is calculating the amount of nutrients that are generated by poultry in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And this is a slide that shows the, the Chesapeake Bay Partnership modeling tools. Um, we have a, you know, the Chesapeake Bay watershed model that was developed by um, the partners that basically you know, looks at what are the nutrients and sediment generated by different sources, what are the practices that are put on the ground to control those sources, and what's the ultimate load of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment that gets into the bay. And then the Chesapeake Bay model simulates those nutrients in the bay and um, determines whether water quality standards are met or not. Um, what U.S. Poultry and Egg Association really wanted to dive into is um, what data did the partnership decide to use to estimate the number of birds produced, um, the amount of manure, and the amount of manure nutrients in that manure. We were really excited about that opportunity to dive deep into this and to get more um, input. Um, you know, a lot of the industry folks cannot, don't have the time to spend at these Chesapeake Bay program meetings. I mean, there, many of you go to these meetings and they're monthly, they're five hours long, um, it's a big slog. And so we worked real closely with the industry to say what would be the best way to engage more of the poultry experts in these discussions that work for their timing. And as we heard from the growers, it's, it's a, you know, they're busy all the time. And so we settled on a, a two-day workshop um, where we could dive deep, open up the hood of the model, and really look at what data are being used and talk about whether there's better data out there. Um, and then we, we had this thing about what are we going to name this workshop, and it sounds trivial, but I think it was important. We, we called it Building a Better Bay Model Workshop because we wanted to imply that, okay, a model's only as good as the data that are in it, and, and if we can get better data and there's a better way to do it, then let's, let's refine it and improve it. And I think that was important. Um, the hosts were U.S. Poultry and Egg and University of Maryland. I think it was important to have the land grants involved in, as you know, host of the event. And then they asked EPA in the form of me and, and, and Gary Shang with the modeling group um, that we would give plenary um, presentations in the morning and in the afternoon of both days to reiterate our desire to have the best data to feed the model because good data means good decisions. And, and so that's how we kind of set up the workshop. We had industry folks there, integrators, um, universities, growers, state ag agencies, and um, USDA and EPA. And we spent two days just going through what data are used in the model now, what did, why did the partnership decide on these data, and are there better ways to describe poultry nutrient generation, and are there better publicly available data out there that we should be using? And, and from that meeting, we had a huge, long report of a lot of great ideas and recommendations for how to refine and improve the data that's feeding the model. So that report went to um, the, the big Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership, that flow chart I was showing you, and the agriculture work group said, we'd like to form a poultry litter subcommittee that can take these recommendations and, and you know, develop the data um, develop more clearly what, how to build that into the model for the Bay program to review and approve. And, and so this subcommittee, um, it had the state ag agencies, the land-grant universities, USDA, EPA. Um, they consulted a lot with the private sector as well. And it was their job to take the recommendations from the workshop and to essentially build the first ever regional poultry nutrient database in the country and explain how that should be used to replace what was currently in the Chesapeake Bay watershed model. And they decided to, to start with, um, with broilers um, on the Delmarva um, since that was a really data rich area. 
so this is my only technical slide, but I, I, I wanted just to give you a feel for what we were using before in the model and what was being proposed to be used in, um, in the model today. Um, when you look at the equation of how you calculate nutrient generation from, from poultry and you, you write it on a blackboard, it, it's really just the poultry nutrient concentrations times the amount of litter generation per bird times the number of birds. It sounds pretty simple. Um, in the past, we used, for, to calculate the nutrient levels in poultry manure, um, the partnership was using national cage bird studies from all over the country. Stuff, this is stuff that USDA used all the time to estimate nutrient generation in poultry operations. And the, um, at the workshop, folks were saying, listen, um, the Delmarva broilers are not well represented with these national cage bird studies. And in fact, we shouldn't be looking at just manure excreta, we should be looking at poultry litter, because that's what we manage, poultry litter. We don't manage manure excreta, we manage the whole litter. And so the big decision was, let's focus on poultry litter nutrients instead. Um, and we were fortunate to have University of Delaware had thousands and thousands of data points on the nutrient concentrations of poultry litter that enabled us to make that switch from excreted manure to um, managing litter. Um, secondly, you know, if we're going to go with a litter-based way of, manage, of describing the nutrient generation, we need to know how much litter we have. And I think it was a surprise to a lot of us that that number is actually kind of hard to come by. And so um, University of Delaware was able to work with the private manure haulers and um, get a, a database of the amount of litter and drew a correlation between the amount of litter generated per bird weight. And it's a really strong correlation. So we have, annually, we have um, information on bird weights and we're able to calculate the amount of litter that's generated based on those weights. And then lastly, um, the number of birds. In the past, we were using the inventory from the five-year ag census. And um, everybody on the poultry litter subcommittee and at the workshop said, you know, with the annual variability we have in bird numbers, we really should be looking at um, the NAS annual survey data. Ultimately, we'd love to have the integrator data, um, but we were focused on what can we get that's publicly accessible today and so the decision was to use the, the, the annual NAS survey information. So the poultry litter subcommittee, um, this took two years. So we had the workshop in 2013. Um, many of those people who were involved in the workshop, no good deed goes unpunished. They had to serve on the subcommittee. And it, it, we hit a lot of bumps in the road on trying to build this regional database, um, but we overcame them all and we were able to um, get the recommendations approved by the Chesapeake Bay program. And so this new regional data and this new approach is replacing what was previously used in the model. So for this next version of the model, which people are calling phase six, it'll have this new data in there. What we learned, um, and I just want to get a little philosophical with you um, at the end here, um, we learned a lot through this process. I, I, we often point to this data input initiative as a huge turning point in how we all work together. Um, and I've been asked to present this as kind of a case study on how we can collaborate and, um, and, and do some good things together, whether it's at the National um, you know, Association of State Departments of Ag meetings, the NASDA meetings, or it's down at the Poultry Expo in Georgia. I've presented this a couple times. Um, you know, it's, we learned how to better engage the ag industry. As I mentioned, they can't come to the table at all these Bay Program meetings. So finding, you know, a, a couple days at key points to get input so that we make sure we're using the best data is critical. Um, EPA, we had to prove, there was this perception out there that we didn't want any more data, that we're out to get agriculture. We needed to prove that we wanted the best data and we were willing to jump through a lot of hoops and come up with a plan A, B, C, D, whatever it takes to get there. Um, the industry, frankly, they needed to prove that they were willing to come to the table, table and share data and share their expertise. Um, and that was huge. Um, and the universities sharing data, but most importantly, coming up with ways to protect farmer privacy because this data needs to be publicly accessible, 
but how do you make it publicly accessible in a way that still protects farmer privacy was critical for this effort. And you know, I think we, we were able to come up with something that works a lot better. We have a lot more um, credibility in the model. I think a lot more confidence in the model. And, and my hope is that it's really strengthened our um, working relationships that we can tackle some, some other tough issues, which Beth will get into regarding you know, calculating the you know, budget on the Delmarva for nutrients. So, um, so that kind of gives you a, a general sense of what we did together um, to improve the model. And, and that's just what goes into the model. Um, so any of you who want to dive deeper, um, we, based on the poultry industry's request, the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership is running a model webinar um, for the new version of the model just for the poultry community to um, not just describe what these new data look like in phase six for the inputs, but what other things in the modeling efforts are being refined, like how are we looking at phosphorus and soils, for example. And so folks will have a big picture of how do all these pieces align when you're modeling not just how much nutrients are generated by the, the poultry operations, but what's actually um, you know, going into the Chesapeake Bay. So I encourage you to participate in that webinar coming up on May 24th. Um, that's, I'm going to stop there and it, I think we're going to have each of us present and then um, we'll have plenty of time for, for questions and, and discussion. Thanks. Thanks. Beth? Well. All right, I'd like to invite Beth. So good morning. Um, I was asked to speak about an effort that's going um, underway right now that Kelly and I and Hans are actually all involved with, which is, is to take some of the information that Kelly just talked about and figure out a mass balance for the Delmarva. Um, it's done under the auspices of uh, the Delmarva Land and Litter Challenge. Um, Andrew mentioned this group this morning. I wanted to start out in case folks aren't familiar with, with what this group is doing or trying to do. I thought I'd give just a little bit of background before I, d I dive into what, um, what I was asked to talk about, which is the uh, mass balance. Okay, so what's the Delmarva Land and Litter Challenge? It was really a group that came together a couple years ago of diverse stakeholders, environmental groups, uh, industry representatives, grain growers, poultry growers on the Delmarva that really had a vision, and, and Kelly mentioned this also, had a vision of wanting an environmentally friendly agriculture and econo that was economically sustainable on the Delmarva. Um, so that was sort of their overall vision for the Delmarva is, is mirroring those two things. Uh, and they specifically committed to uh, a couple of goals that relate to the, the mass balance, which is a, a goal of having a regionally neutral um, in terms of importing and exporting nutrients. Um, and then also that nutrients would be utilized on operations without negative environmental impact. So these are two, two commitments that were made, two goals that were set um, for this group by 2025 that sort of kicked off uh, the, the mass balance work that I'm going to talk about. Um, but a little bit more information about the land and litter challenge. Uh, there's a steering committee that has about 27 members, again, very diverse representation. There's an executive uh, committee, actually Andrew McLean, who was on the panel previously, is the, um, is the current chair. Uh, there's a transport subcommittee. One of the questions is, is how do we, what's going on both from Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, so it's a tri-state effort on the Delmarva. Uh, where's, what's going on with the state's transport programs? Um, how can we do that more efficiently? They actually just released a report that you can access on the Delmarva Land and Litter webpage if you want to. Uh, there's also a, a group that's the Innovation Solutions Action Team, which is focused on alternate uses, innovative solutions, whether it's manure or energy or composting or some of the other technologies that are out there to, um, to deal with um, manure. And then there's the Mass Balance Subcommittee. And I should say, it's, you know, the, the, um, the charge of the subcommittee is, is basically to do a mass balance of nutrients. And this has been an issue that has, I know since I've been at the Bay Foundation, we've had many, um, I don't say arguments, but we haven't had a number that, that ag will agree to, that environmental community will agree to in terms of um, the extent of excess manure nutrients on the Delmarva. Um, some will say it's not very much, if, if any. Um, you heard from the panel today that, that the folks on the panel had no, uh, grower panel had no trouble getting rid of their litter. 
Um, I think part of it's locational. So there, the, the idea behind this mass balance work group is could we come up with a number or a range of numbers that would speak to the, the notion of excess nutrients? And that then opens the door for solutions. You know, one of the things I think has stifled some of the innovations on the Delmarva has been that we don't have a clear answer of how much extra is there. So if you want to burn it or you want to compost it, you want to build your business plan, having a clear idea of how much extra are we talking about is really important. So it's really, really key to, to driving solutions and, and to ultimately achieving the goal of the Delmarva Land and Litter Challenge, which is a sort of regionally neutral and, and applying nutrients in, a, in an environmentally friendly fashion. Um, so our end game is, is we want to go down the county level. Um, that's important for um, transport purposes. I think the, the one would suspect that there are some counties that have more um, nutrients than can be land applied in an environmentally friendly fashion on cropland, but then you have other counties that, that could actually use manure. So understanding at a county scale where those imbalances are is really important. Um, we have a commitment to use the best available data, and in fact, the work that Kelly talked about um, is directly feeding into our mass balance. We're taking the, the information from the poultry litter subcommittee, both on the number of birds, the amount of manure, uh, the nutrient contents um, of that manure. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the end game is we, this, this is to, to tee up solutions for um, both from the transport end as well as alternative uses. Um, this is the list of the subcommittee. I've highlighted some folks in red. You know, every every group has the real doers, and those that are highlighted in red are the are the real um, doers in this is exercise. It's very data intensive, um, coming up with the assumptions that are going in for how much, uh, how where's the how much cropland, how much nutrients can you apply to cropland. So I wanted to specifically call out some of those folks in red who have really been what we're, we call the the deep data divers. They've been really um, helpful in moving this effort forward. So the group um, has been operating for about a year and a half. Um, we've kind of taken a circuitous um, path, I think, um, but we've settled on two approaches to doing this 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 nutrient balance. And again, the the, the balance is uh, the all of all the nutrients on the shore from all sources, um, and looking at that that versus how much cropland there is to accept those nutrients. So we we are looking at two approaches that I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, one is based on crop need. So if I can find the pointer. Um, um, so we, you know, on the, on the one hand, you want to figure out where the nutrients are that are produced on the, on the Delmarva. So that includes inorganic fertilizer. Uh, that's based on fertilizer sales data, and we've actually got that information from the Chesapeake Bay program. Uh, manure, Kelly just talked about the, the work of the poultry litter subcommittee, so we're using that information, but there's also other livestock that are grown on the shore, so we're incorporating those animal numbers from the USDA ag statistics information. Um, there's nitrogen that's fixed through soybeans, so we want to kind of count that as a nutrient. And then there's soil phosphorus. We have a big reservoir of, of phosphorus in some of our soils over here, and so we need to um, incorporate that information. On the removal side, um, off the top, we're taking manure that we know is transported basically off the Delmarva or to alternative uses like Purdue AgriCycle, so it's sort of coming off the ledger. Uh, and then the, in terms of the other key feature is we are using uh, nutrient management recommendations for the various crops that are going. So again, this is all the county scale. We, can, we have access to information about what crops are grown at the county scale. And then we look at the nutrient application rates that would be, be recommended for those crops. Um, and then this, this approach actually also considers soil phosphorus um, because uh, folks know anything about managing um, phosphorus management plans is that if you have a certain level of phosphorus in your soils, you wouldn't be able to add any more phosphorus, and so we need to take that into account in our, in our mass balance using this approach. So that's the crop need because it's based on nutrient management uh, crop needs. Uh, the other approach we uh, are using, and I'll tell you why we're using two approaches um, after this, is on the, on the input side, it's uh, source side, it's, it's Pretty much the same, except for this. In this approach, we're not considering soil phosphorus. Uh, 
So we're considering all the other inputs uh, in the as were in the previous slide. Again, we're taking off the top what gets transported either out of the watershed, for example, to uh, the Kennett Square mushroom area or to Purdue AgriCycle or all other uh, similar alternative uses. Uh, and then instead of looking at uh, the nutrients that are applied based on crop need, in this case, you're actually reducing nutrients by an expectation of how much the crop is actually taking up, um, how much of the harvest the crop is sort of leaving. Um, and this, again, this method doesn't uh, look at soil phosphorus approach. So why are we doing two approaches? Um, the group, the mass balance group, thought there were benefits to looking at it both ways, and you will get slightly different answers looking at it both ways, but they, we thought that they provided different in pieces of information. So the crop need approach really is sort of relevant to how we do business now in terms of we're, we're, we're adding, we're following nutrient management plans, farmers are following nutrient management plans, and that is dictating how much of that, those nutrients are being used at a county scale. Um, so that's sort of, you know, you saw sort of simulating, I would say, ex existing conditions. But the crop removal approach kind of gives you an insight, like looking long term, if you're looking at a county scale and you're looking at, uh, at, at the phosphorus or nitrogen imbalance at a county scale, it can provide some insights to what might happen in the long term. For example, what if you had a county um, that, that actually had um, high levels of soil phosphorus, but um, but actually had, well, I guess you wouldn't really have that, but it provides some insights to, um, to the uptake versus the removal versus addition of nutrients that I think can provide some insights for the long term of how we're, how we're managing, um, how we're managing our, our nutrients. And hopefully it won't be too confusing in the final report that's supposed to come out to this, but we'll, we'll, we'll need some communications experts on that. Um, so one of the challenges that we had to overcome is that, again, we wanted to use soil phosphorus level information. Uh, we wanted it to be relatively current information. We wanted it at the county scale. Um, it had to be publicly available. Um, and we wanted to associate with these FIV values. If folks aren't familiar with FIV, it's, uh, it stands for fertility index value. And it's really a way of, uh, I would say, making the phosphorus numbers relative to crop uptake. Um, phosphorus availability in soils is, is largely influenced by the soil type and those kinds of things. And so um, this, using an FIV value, does two things. One is it allows you to compare if different labs have done the analysis. It allows you to sort of normalize for that. It also allows you to, to basically gives you an estimate of the available phosphorus given the, the soil type. So uh, in, uh, the scale is a unitless scale. It goes from zero to whatever. But um, generally in the range of around 50 to 100 um, is considered, 100 would be sort of the optimum um, available for, for a plant. Um, so we had a gap in that Maryland has collected a lot of soil phosphorus information um, and met our needs at the county scale, but we didn't have similar data for Delaware and Virginia. And we really, again, wanted to do this at the county scale because that really informs the policy decisions that we want to make moving forward. So um, how do we fill that gap? So we came up with a... Um, a really simple equation that basically, oh good, ooh, it doesn't look very good, does it? Okay, um, not sure what happened there, but um, uh, where we, look, we took Maryland's data and we plotted on the y-axis the, their soil test phosphorus fertility index value of by county over a certain FIV value. So we picked in this case 100 FIV and looked at the percent of crop, percent of their samples, which we translated into acres, that would be, um, in this case, a, uh, is it above, percent, percent of acres that would be above 150. Um, and then we plotted that versus basically how much phosphorus was in poultry litter divided by harvested cropland. So that, that, you know, if you, the way to think about it is it, it makes intuitive sense that where you're going to have high soil phosphorus are areas where you're going to have a lot of poultry litter production and not much cropland to put it on. That's sort of the simple assumption here. So if, if we can do, look at that relationship with Maryland data, can we then use that, basically that equation to estimate um, for Virginia and Delaware where we have phosphorus and litter and the cropland but we don't have that soil FIV. Um, so you can see the, the relationship is actually pretty good. It's an R-square of 
0.871, so with one being the best. So it's a pretty good relationship. Um, this is something we want to get peer reviewed, but it, it seemed to make sense and the mass balance group felt fairly comfortable that we could use this relationship to then estimate um, soils in Virginia and Delaware counties over a certain percentage of, a, of an FIV that we would choose. So where we are, um, uh, so this summer we are planning to get some technical experts probably from outside the watershed, maybe some inside the watershed to just review the assumptions that we're making um, and the inputs. So to, to review our assumptions regarding nutrient application rates, um, where we got the data, um, all those kinds of things just to make sure that we're on the, the right path. Uh, then the mass balance subcommittee is going to reconvene after we get those reviewer information back, discuss it. Um, hopefully we can reach consensus census on an approach moving forward, um, and then we would basically crank through the numbers, write a report summarizing all the assumptions and what we did, um, hopefully in a clear fashion, and then, uh, and then we could move forward with that. Uh, Kelly warned me not to put a final report date on. We've had dates that we have, we've had deadlines that we have missed, um, so I'm not going to publicly state what, what our, our deadline is um, for a final report, but uh, we will do our best to hopefully get it out by the end of the year, but we'll, we'll see. Well, good morning. It certainly is a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I just, before I really get started in my presentation, I really appreciate the comments that have been mentioned here today. Um, the comments that Kelly mentioned that, you know, when it takes, you know, we all have a vested interest in clean water. And it takes a balanced approach when we live, we work, we travel in a watershed that we all have an impact on water quality. And so I appreciate the panel with the farmers uh, because at one time before I took this role, I was a farmer. I still am. Um, and I'm fortunate when I have a, a strong family that allows me to come back to the farm and work when I can. Um, but, um, you know, it takes a lot of time away from your family, away from your farm. And, um, you know, it takes a, the partnerships that work together, the farmers, the environmental community, the, um, the government agencies and so forth to make sure that we come up with a plan to, um, to reach our goals of clean water but also a, a healthy community. So this morning I was asked to um, give a little bit of an update on where we are with the phosphorus management tool. Um, so just, I wanted to just, again, um, just an explanation of where the, of what the PMT is um, and what implementing the, the phosphorus risk assessment. Now, this is what the PMT is. It's a tool to use to judge or to, to um, address the risk of phosphorus loss in soils. No matter where your phosphorus levels are, but it's a, it's a way to, to um, address or to figure out where your risk is. So this was a result, this tool was a result of years of University of Maryland research um, in collaboration with uh, a lot of scientists across the country and uh, to show where science is the best and where it's um, the most, using the most up-to-date science that's th that is out there. I've traveled around the country quite a bit um, prior to this role and talking to a lot of different groups, a lot of farming uh, groups about where Maryland is, where uh, Maryland agriculture is, um, living within a, uh, an environmentally sensitive area and how do we farm. About 10 years ago, I spoke in Chicago to a, a national group of about 500 farmers that were in the room. And I was asked by the moderator, how do you farm in an environmentally sensitive area? So as I went through some of the uh, procedures or some of the, the requirements that the farmer uh, panel talked about here earlier, I saw a lot of head shaking, a lot of disbelief, a lot of giggling in the room. But today, seven years later, thereabouts, five, seven years later, these agricultural communities, these farmers, these environmental groups are coming to Maryland and asking us, how do you do it? 
we're setting in here in Maryland, we're showing how it can be done and how you can come to the table with all various different groups and how you can find a way to meet the environmental goals that we need to all address, but to also provide food uh, for, our, for our, our community, for our country, and for the world, and how we can live in, in this area. So we're setting the template. We're showing, our Maryland farmers are showing how it can be done. So what is the phosphorus management tool? It takes a, a couple different components. It's looking at erosion. It's looking at surface runoff of dissolved, of, of dissolved phosphorus and looking at subsurface loss of dissolved phosphorus, which gives us what this phosphorus risk value may be. So when the phosphorus management tool came about, there were four enhancements that needed to be addressed. One was that there would be an immediate ban of all phosphorus applications of both organic and inorganic phosphorus applied to any fields that had an FI or fo or fertility index value above 500. That went into effect in June of 2015, so that's already been going on for nearly two years. The second enhancement was that we needed to have real data to show where we were as far as what were the phosphorus levels are on farmland. And there was a lot of assumptions out there that um, the figures I was reading, 80% of the eastern shore had high, uh, excessively high phosphorus uh, soils and on the western shore there were 40%. And understanding that those numbers really came from a modeling exercise to see where, how the tool would work. But what we really needed to do was have real data. So the Department of Agriculture was tasked and our nutrient management program was tasked to getting all that data from every farm field across the state. The third enhancement was that farmers needed time to change their management in adapting to the PMT. So I'll, I'll go a little bit into that in a minute. And then the fourth enhancement was to make sure that we had um, critical elements in place for, farm, for where manure was being generated on agriculture, and it wasn't just poultry, it's poultry, beef, dairy, hog, anywhere where there was manure, if it couldn't be applied on, the, on that farm, we needed to have some sort of, an, of, of element out there that we could handle the manure and move it to locations where um, either we could be better utilized or to have some other uh, element out there that we could repurpose that manure into something, other purposes. So to date, um, there's nearly almost 1.3 million farm acres out there that fall under regulated nutrient management plans across the state. To date, we've got, we have collected, the Department of Agriculture and our nutrient management program has collected nearly 1.1 million acres of data which is about 85%. Um, and as you can see, about 79% of those farm fields across the state have um, an FIV, or excuse me, acres, have an FIV below 150. And, um, and when you look at, and I, sp I spoke about uh, the excess over 500, um, there's about 1.3% of the acres across the state that have, um, that are above 500. And I would just like to point out that there are acres, there are fields in every county in this state that have, that have an FIV above 500. It's not just the eastern shore, it's not just the lower shore, but the ratio is, yes, the lower shore has, the percentage is higher. But the, the fact of the matter is that there are high pea soils across the whole state. So I, can, I have a chart or a, a spreadsheet that I normally show, and usually I, I give it as a handout when I speak to groups. Um, and I wasn't quite sure how many would be here. So I can, actually, I can consolidate the chart so you, hopefully you can read it from your chairs of the various different regions across the state. And if you look, I'm always 
because I give a lot of presentations in front of the General Assembly because there's an, a vested interest in knowing where we are as far as uh, getting the, the balance of the soil data. And I'm constantly asked about the Lower Eastern Shore. So I'll, because we're talking about poultry and Eastern Shore and so forth, I'll, 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 I'll point down just on the Eastern Shore. On the Upper Eastern Shore, which would be uh, Cecil, Kent, and Queen Anne's counties, um, we've collected about 90% of the data and if you are, um, excuse me, about 96% of the data, I'm sorry, 90% have an FIV below 150, and of all the way across to the end, you have about 0.23% have FIVs above 500. When you work your way down to the lower eastern shore where we've collected about 90% of the, of, the, of the acreage so far, uh, about 30% have FIVs below um, below 150 and about a little over 11 percent of those acres on those lower three counties Somerset, Worcester and Wicomico have FIVs above 500. And then um, as I said on the, the bottom uh, line has the whole state um, as I mentioned earlier. So our goal to get to collect all this data those who write nutrient management plans were required to send into the state, to the department, all the phosphorus data that was coming out of nutrient management plans. And um, where the department is right now, I mean, our goal is always to be 100%. And our field specialists are reaching out to farms where we're, we haven't collected the data. They're reaching out, they're visiting with those farms, getting the balance of that data, doing an audit uh, of those farms. Um, so that we can get, so we can get the rest of the data, because it's important to give us an idea, so we know where to focus our resources once we have all that data. So the second step has been is to, um, as I talked about with the enhancements, is giving farmers time to um, change their management of how they're going to um, on their farms where they have high pea soils, because recognizing that the PMT only affects those fields that have an FIV above 150 to 499. Does not affect those fields below 150. So the next, the next task that uh, consultants were supposed to, were required to do was to take all the nutri um, look at, at their, the plans that they write for each farmer to average out their FIVs that are above 150 and whatever that average was put you into a, into a tiers A, B, or C. Tier C would be um, if you had an FIV on your fields there that averaged above 450, you would be the first tier that would start, uh, start that first transition into um, moving forward to the, um, utilizing the PMT. And that transition time would start in uh, 2018. For the last two years, um, or 2016 and 17, farmers on those fields would, were required to in their plans to have both PSI, or phosphorus site index recommendations, and a phosphorus management tool recommendations to, um, so farmers could see what the difference was in fertility recommendations or phosphorus recommendations on those particular fields. So the first transition for those farms that had, that had an, uh, the average uh, tier of 450 or greater will start in 2018. Um, tier B uh, will start in 2019 and, and tier A with 150 to 300 FIVs will start in 2020. And eventually by the time 20, 2022 gets here, um, everybody will be implementing the PMT on those, on those particular fields. So, as I mentioned earlier, the, the transition management, there's, there's, a manage, there's a phase one and a phase two as you get towards the uh, PMT. What's, what's the PMT does, it's more site specific. So it doesn't look at the whole, the whole region of Maryland, it looks at that particular field. And as I mentioned earlier, it's looking at not only your types of soils and where your phosphorus level is, but the critical components of it is looking at subsurface drainage and um, distance to water. So 
the next step was required once you knew which tier you were going to fall into was take each field step by step and plug that those um, plug those fields into the PMT to find out where your risk category was. So if you were starting in transition one, if you were a high risk, you would only be putting one year crop removal down. If you were in the low risk, you would be putting a three crop, utilizing an end based plan, you would be putting down a three crop removal. And then as you move into uh, transition two, um, you again, you know, be more restrictive on those high P soils. And then once you go into the, P, to, to the PMT, um, would even be more restrictive. The one thing I'd like to comment is that even if a field with those critical components of sub subsurface drainage and distance to water, that if you had a field, and I'll give you an example, and you want to compare fields, take one in Somerset County, where you have a relatively high tab water table, and you take a field in Carroll County, where you don't, but you have more issues with distance to water, where it, that, those fields have, um, could have a, an impact. Even if those two fields had the same FIVs, they may get completely different recommendations as far as what their requirements could be based off of what the risk assessment tool would tell you. Part of this transition in farmers um, moving forward is an e the department was required to do an economic um, analysis. So there were eight farms that were, that were selected uh, or farmers actually volunteered to participate in this study. We had four poultry farms and four dairy farms across, uh, across the state. Um, and those fields that we compared ranged anywhere from 59 to 104 acres. And in each participant who participated in this was compensated uh, for the extra time that they did to uh, pulling that data together for the department and sending it in. So as I, as I mentioned, when you compare those two fields and looking at more site specific, we looked at those fields in, um, in, in, the, in the study. And if you, utilizing the PSI, when you ran that tool, 75% of those fields had a low risk, 25% were medium, 0% zero, um, zero were high risk loss. With the PMT, that changed quite a bit. You went from a 30% low risk, 30% medium, and 38% high risk loss. And then to take it further, using one field as an example, where a farmer used the PSI for his recommendations where he could use manure, um, the cost for his inputs, um, the fertilizer, and the application of those nutrients was about $91.40, whereas if utilizing the PMT, where he cannot, where it, the reading was you couldn't use manure, the cost per acre was $122, which with a difference of about $31.30, which was a result of you know additional nitrogen on the um, on the commercial side. It was $31 higher utilizing uh, the PMT, where they couldn't use manure. As I mentioned earlier, you know another. The last enhancement was trying to make sure that there were some critical element, elements that were available to handle manure if it couldn't be land applied. And manure transport is a key um, program within our department that we help uh, work with farmers um, and poultry integrators who participate in the program, who, who commit funds to this program to um, move the manure. We worked with the, uh, the Land and Litter Challenge group. Uh, we came up with a program that, um, that would work with us, that we could work within our regulations within Maryland to make it um, uh, a little less red tape, but not lose, um, or to make sure that you know, the, the program did what it was supposed to do, not you know, infringing on the environmental. Um, impacts and so forth to make sure that, you know, farmers had a, an out, a, a way that they could move that manure from one place to another. So in FY6, 2016, through the program, we moved about 213,000 tons of manure with a payment of about 1.4 million. 
And as you can see, about, only about 57,000 tons was poultry manure. The balance was, were other manures, and that's primarily dairy manure out in Western Maryland. Um, and out of the poultry manure that we moved, only about 6,000 tons was actually land applied. And that was generally uh, for Southern Maryland. Uh, farmers were bringing uh, grain over to the Eastern shore and hauling manure back. Um, and just a little bit of a history, this program has been going on since 1999. And the first couple years, we were just dealing with poultry manure. And as the time went on, as I mentioned earlier, um, in 2000, or FY16, we were hauling more of um, more non-poultry manure through that program. And again, I, I, just another visual of the changeover from um, the poultry manure um, a lot, uh, through our program, the majority of it is going for alternative use. Um, as Beth mentioned, you know, produce recycling plant or it goes to the mushroom farms up in Pennsylvania. So the purpose of that program is moving manure. In this case, it's moving manure out of the watershed. And then I just wanted to mention when you, the, the information that the, the department collects um, every year that the, um, the farmer uh, panel had spoken about all their record keeping and so forth. At the end of the year, farmers are required to send into the department an annual implementation report that uh, basically uh, they'll, through their record keeping that they collect every, they keep every year, uh, will send into the department the amount of nutrients that are uh, applied to their farms. Under their CAFO permits, they're required to uh, keep uh, track on how much manure is being generated through, um, uh, on their operation. So in 2015, through the reporting, through those AIR reports that the department collects, uh, there was 383,000 tons of manure that was taken out of the houses and moved to, one, moved to one area, whether it was land application or to the alternative uses. Using a two-ton application rate, and just looking at the eastern shore, and if you, look, if you remember back on the, on the phosphorus soil data and looking at where the phosphorus uh, levels are across, across the state, and let's just focus on the eastern shore for a moment, that between the upper, between the whole eastern shore of Maryland, there are 477,000 acres that have an FIV below 150. And using that two ton rate, if you were to use all the manure that was generated, all the manure that was coming out of the houses in 2015, you would need about 191,000 acres of cropland to take all the manure. And I'm just, I'm, I'm not gonna get into the, um, the the technology, Louise Lawrence is going to speak, I think, a little bit later on, on, the, uh, on the technology, but we're also looking at other um, means out there to repurpose manure, whether it's to making, taking manure and creating it into energy, and I think Louise is going to talk a little bit about that. So I think that's it. Thank you. Mm Uh, the first question is a concern about the EPA and its longevity over the next four years. So do you have, are you capable of answering that? That's a, it's, it's an unknown, um, but I, I would say that um, in, in our world with agriculture, we, we need to find ways that we can collaborate and work together and if we can work together to identify where the issues are related to water quality and work together to solve them, we're all in a better place because we're building those relationships for the long haul. Um, we talk about wanting agriculture to be sustainable. I want our relationships to be sustainable so that we find these win-win ways of moving forward to have both you know, profitable ag and clean water. And so when you look at this new administration coming in, a lot of that philosophy is there. And so I feel like we have an opportunity to show that rather than regulating and litigating more, um, if we can figure out ways that we could collaborate more, um, we have an opportunity now to demonstrate that. Um, 
can't really talk about budgets. Your guess is as good as mine, but the more we can find those win-wins where it's economically advantageous for a grower to implement certain practices and it's also good for water quality, then we're, that, that's the kind of stuff we should be supporting. And, and you know, we, we have a lot of grant programs that in the Farm Bill really helps to fill in some gaps where economically it might not be feasible for a producer but is important for water quality. Um, so we'll see how it goes, but my main message is, you know, we're stronger when we're together, and, um, and that kind of mentality should work in any administration. Thank you. Very well done, by the way. <laughs> um, there's a number of questions um, that are detailed about the PMT. Um, so um, just some details. Um, Hans, what does crop removal entail? Do the P levels drop how are cover crops involved in that? How are they planted? Do they lie fallow as a first one? And there's a few others that I'm, I'm not sure we'll get to them all, but see if you can answer quickly. Okay. Um, when it comes to cover crops, you know, we, I think we just put out an announcement about two weeks ago, I believe it was. Um, again, for about the Fifth, sixth straight year, we've had record cover crops. About five, almost 560,000 acres across the state of cover crops that were planted. I think that's a tremendous credit to the farmers, the um, because they, they've gone above and beyond the call of duty. They have a small window to work with in the fall, and I think you got to understand that farmers have to work around what Mother Nature gives them. And in the fall, when you're trying to get your crops in when the weather is good and, the, and then we're asking on top of that to plant cover crops, th there's a, that's a lot to ask for. And so when you're looking at having record acres of, 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 the, of cover crops, you know, we're looking towards uh, reducing our nutrient load into the bay, reducing nitrogen and sediment. There's some benefits towards phosphorus, but we really look at cover crops as more of, a, of helping us with our nitrogen goals. Is that pretty much? Yep. Just a, a quick question. There's a number that are asking about where are your standards. So questions about um, 38,000 tons needed for 191 acres. Um, why FIV of 150 and not 100? Um, you know, where are you getting your data? Um, do you use research, and to what extent do you use research in your data? So, so the PMT came out of research that the University of Maryland did. Mm -hmm. So that 150 was based out of University of Maryland research. That's where the baseline was set. So that's where we're, that is what we're working with. The 383,000 tons of manure was data that was collected out of the reporting that farmers are required to send into the department. And like I think somebody had mentioned earlier, maybe not, but you know, when the data comes into the department, and our, our, our field specialists and so forth are analyzing each one of those reports. If something looks a little, a little off, you know, our, our field specialists are reaching back out to those farmers to make sure that the data is, is accurate. So we're not just collecting it and putting it in the file, but we're, we're reviewing it and making sure that the data is as accurate as possible. And using as much current scientific literature to update and inform as you're able to. Exactly. I mean, up until the PMT, you know, there hadn't been a lot of research done on phosphorus. A lot of it, all, a lot of focus had been on, on nitrogen. And farmers had been using, you know, what they had been taught in schools for years and years and years was to bank the phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, science changes. And so, you know, or I should say science changes, but the, you know, there, right, so I mean, we can, by the research that's, that's developed through our universities, and because through our legislation and through our law, we are required to use university recommendations, um, we're, that's giving us guidance to, as, as we move forward. So one of the other things I'd like to, I, I would like to also to mention that, you know, we've gotten to a, te a, a stage now in technology where it is rapidly, I mean rapidly changing. Now, we're at a stage now with nitrogen where, you know, we can, gr we can go across the field, a farmer can go across the field and variable rate his nitrogen across the field looking at the, the, um, 
the, the vigor of the crop and tell whether, and it can compute to a computer how much nitrogen is, that crop needs. We, I, don't think, I don't think we've gotten there quite yet with the phosphorus. But what we can do right now through the PMT is, is we can utilize that science and that university data to make sure that we're doing the best we can to minimize the impact on phosphorus loss. Great. So a, a general question, especially about um, the assessment and um, bay cleanup, and a, an overall question about how are we doing? What does the 2017 assessment tell us? And what is the role of ag? So there's a question here about how does farmer profitability factor into the Bay model and the requirements that um, the farmers anticipate, uh, a recognition that there may be more pressure put on ag to pick up slack where maybe municipalities um, can't. So I think there's a general question of where are we and, and is ag sustainability considered as we move forward in the, the Bay program? I'll, I'll start, and I bet you um, Hans will probably want to add some stuff from Maryland's perspective. Um, absolutely, farmer economics should be considered as states are refining their watershed implementation plans. Um, they're in the process right now of updating those plans, starting the updating of those plans. And as I mentioned in the pie chart I showed, states are relying on agriculture a lot to help reduce their nutrient and sediment loads. Um, in Pennsylvania, they're relying on agriculture to achieve 75% of the reductions. In Maryland and Virginia, it's more in the 40% range. In Delaware, it's over 90%. Why is that? It's because ag is the biggest land use in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, just second to forest. And relatively speaking, from a cost standpoint, it's, it's more cost effective to reduce ag loads than expensive urban retrofits, but that stat is always difficult to hear when you think about who's actually bearing the, the cost, and it, it's the farmer versus, you know, users, you know, increasing surcharges for a treatment plant, for example. Um, but the, the pollution diet really, um, at the state level, they make those decisions of how to allocate the reductions among the sources, and, and I know, you know, the current plans have quite aggressive goals for wastewater treatment plants going down to the limit of technology. Um, they've already met their goals 10 years ahead of schedule. And they have very aggressive goals for urban stormwater runoff controls. And I would say overall, that's been the biggest challenge is urban is the fastest growing land use and probably the most difficult to um, reduce the loads. But if you've got a, a pollution diet and a state plan, that sets goals for each sector and everybody's doing their fair share, um, then that they can be held accountable in that way. And so my, my plea to the ag community is make sure you're involved and at the table when the state is updating their implementation plan and make sure that what's committed to is realistic and, and is able to be achieved um, so that you're not stuck with um, unachievable goals. Thoughts? Quickly. Okay, I'll, I'll just add to that, just to piggyback on what Kelly said, you know, it is important, and I can't emphasize this enough, that farmers are at the table to look at moving down the road how we're going to ultimately reach our goals. Um, you can, we can only do what the latest technology has that's out there. Mm -hmm. And this technology is expensive. Department of Agriculture has a cost share program that to help farmers make sure that they're that we can that we have some cost share assistance to bring them into um, to make sure that they have the BMPs, the best management practices in place to address, you know, how to handle manure, how to handle uh, animal mortality, you know, whether we have to stream, uh, whether farmers have to fence out uh, cattle out of streams or whatever, there's a multitude of practices out there that we help cost share because these practices are very expensive. And as I said, when I first said, when I stood up was that we all have, we all have an impact on water quality, we all have a vested interest, whether you're agriculture or whether you're a citizen here in Maryland, and that it's collectively that we're working together. Yes, agriculture is the biggest um, land use 
within our water sh- or within Maryland, within our watershed. Um, and so, yeah, there's going to be a lot that's going to be taxed on the uh, farming and the, and the ag community. But we're also looking at other, tor- other sources or other types of programs or um, ways of handling um, how we're going to meet, move forward to reach our goals, whether it's through nutrient trading or wh- whatever it may be. So, I mean, cover crops, for an example, you know, the state has 22 well, this year it'll be over $25 million invested in cover crops. Cover crops being the most cost-effective way of reducing nutrient load, reducing nitrogen load into the bay. So I think farmers, again, should be very proud of what they're doing, um, but we should also be very cognizant of the economic impact that it is going to have on farmers as we move down the road towards reaching our 2025 goals. Great. And with that, I want to thank our panel and remind everyone that these uh, presentations will be on the Hughes Center website, and we can give you access to that information if you ask Nancy or myself. But thank you all for your participation and your great information.